This week has been incredibly, incredibly busy for us. Um, we processed 41 new cases this week. In, uh, that includes the double homicide, which, as you know, um, takes a significant amount of resources as well. So 41, is that a new record? Well, I don't keep, I don't keep track of them in that way, but right. um, I believe it is. That's amazing. Um, we had 15 violent crimes, four endangerment mm-hmm. crimes, a whole bunch of property crimes and several drug, serious drug crimes where the allegation is possession of either methamphetamine or heroin with the intent to distribute it. In Missoula? In Missoula. So the, the violent crimes included two new strangulation cases, assault on a minor, assault with a weapon, um, two assault with a weapon cases, one involving a drinking glass as the alleged weapon, um, two deliberate homicide cases, um, two sex cases, sexual intercourse without consent, and sexual abuse of children, four aggravated burglary cases, and two assaults, one in- involving a fight that occurred in a bar. Imagine that, a fight occurring in a bar. That's, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I, it just seems like no matter where you turn right now, uh, things are going a little bit crazy, and I'm wondering, I know, I realize it's probably just coincidental, Kirsten, but the fires and the smoke and uh, the hot weather, has, has that, do you think that's a contributing factor to any of this stuff, just maybe aggravating? Well, it's certainly not helping anything, Peter. Um, to be fair, some of these crimes did not occur this last week. We were getting caught up on our charging, so some of them are um, cases where we've sent the summons out and the defendant has not yet appeared in court. Right. But many of them were um, occurred this week, and the person was arrested and placed in custody on a probable cause hold. So, yes, it's been a very busy week. Tell me, tell me about that process when when someone has been charged with a crime, and yet uh, people are concerned. Well, why hasn't that person been taken into custody? What's going on? And there's there's a process involved there before you can actually charge someone, right? There is a process, Peter, and as you know, the standard is probable cause. If the person pre- presents an immediate risk either to other people, um, a risk that they're going to damage evidence, or a risk that they're going to flee the jurisdiction, then the officers are obligated to put them into custody at the time. If they don't meet that criteria, then generally speaking, they would refer a case over to us or the city attorney's office or the U- United States attorney's office to review for charges. At that point, then we would file a charge and ask the judge either to issue a summons if the person is very likely to appear voluntarily and not commit crimes in the meantime, or if we think that they are a risk, we would rush that through and ask the judge to issue a warrant rather than a summons. Um, then if the warrant's issued, they're, as soon as there's any contact by law enforcement, they're brought in and brought before the nearest and most accessible judge. If we issue a summons, that they're likely to appear in approximately two weeks um, and, and come in voluntarily on a predetermined court date. Now, I, I saw that a case that you were heavily involved in in the last year or so, the case of Cody Marble, that he has been arrested and uh, is being brought back to Missoula on a probation violation. Is that something you've had a chance to look into? Um, yes, I have a little bit. He's, he's not been brought back. There's currently a warrant outstanding for his arrest. Okay. And uh, do we know what the probation violated? Was he not supposed to leave the state, or do we know yet? Um, it's not something I'm at liberty to discuss right now. I understand. I understand. Now, there, there is another question that people are always asking me about wherever I go, because when they, they know I speak with you uh, on, uh, on a weekly basis, and that is uh, why it seems that we keep seeing people's names in the news who have been charged with a crime and then released or charged with a crime and then had a plea agreement or whatever, uh, and, and they keep getting into trouble. And so people are saying, why can't they just keep them in jail? So... How, how do you respond to that? Well, that's a pretty pretty loaded question, but there's <laughs> lots of different reasons for that. Um, there have been several instances in the in the past year where we've asked for uh, an incarceration sentence, and the judge has disagreed with us and given us given something more lenient. There are other situations where the person, by all um, objective standards, isn't deemed a uh, risk to reoffend, and yet they do. I mean, nobody has a crystal ball. Um, there's certainly not enough jail beds and prison beds to put everyone who commits a crime in custody for that crime. I mean, our, our obli- our, we have an obligation to not only punish people, but to try to help them and rehabilitate them so that we 
don't have them coming back again. And that, that serves a twofold purpose. Not only does it help the person and their family, but it helps the taxpayers because it's a lot cheaper to have somebody out earning money, being a productive member of the community, rather than paying to have them in jail. And so most of what we do is a process of trying to determine who presents the greatest risk. Um, I, I, I would like to um, tell you that I'm all in favor of moving towards a more of a risk-based system and use those precious criminal justice dollars and pu- invest them in the folks that we need to um, keep away from the community and, and use those criminal justice dollars in a way that doesn't just necessarily punish people but helps identify the ones that are more likely to reoffend.